Okay, folks, I think we'll make a start. So uh, thank you all for coming. It's great to have you here. We have a small but select audience, which is nice. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Matthew Jarron. I'm the museum curator here. Uh, we're delighted to have Michael Stephen Clark with us this evening. Uh, so Michael's a writer and publisher, and he's worked for many years in zoos, uh, both in Britain and in Europe. Uh, and he's also been on uh, field trips to Madagascar uh, and the Comoros Islands, and that's very much informed his recent book, which he happens to have copies of, which I'm sure he'd be happy to sell you at the end, uh, called The Fragmented World of the Mongoose Lemur, uh, and he's going to tell us the story about that uh, critically endangered animal this evening. So, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. I'm grateful because I was dreading saying all that myself, but I just said that I didn't introduce myself. Um, so that saved us all a lot of time, uh, time and trouble. Um, we'll crack straight on with it. Um, my primary interest throughout my zoo career, which I feel started at London, um, I was there for more than 20 years, I've worked in zoos previously, but um, all the things that I wanted to do um, began there and continued there until I left. Um, there's a couple of things to know first, is that a lot of the information upon which the book is based and a lot of the information that I'm going to share with you um, this evening is about 30 years old. Um, that's not to say it's out of date, it's because work on the Mongoose Lehman in particular has been incredibly intermittent. I published a paper about um, the Mongoose Lehman on Anjuan, the Comoran island of Anjuan, in the mid-90s and there wasn't anything else about the Mongoose Lehman on Anjuan until 2009 and there has been very very little since. So we're looking here at something of a Cinderella species, a species that people pay, pay attention to sometimes and this is remarkable um, because as you'll, you'll see as we go on that it is deservedly so a critically endangered species but there's also reasons why there's complacency around it. Part of that reason is because it exists in three subpopulations. It exists in the wild on Madagascar. So you'll see in an encyclopedia the mongoose lemur is found only in Madagascar. It only comes from Madagascar. Well, it's found on Anjuan in the Comoros Islands in great numbers. And if it's truly a critically endangered species, which I believe it is, then the captive population has to play a part which is really where I came in. Incidentally, those populations aren't managed interactively. That'll be something <coughs> as we go on, but I thought I'd say that. They're among the most charming of the lemurs. The male is on the left, the female is on the right. We'll say a little bit more about dimorphism as we go on. But first of all, we need to ask, what is a lemur? A lemur is a prosimian primate, that means it's some kind of proto-monkey in some people's eyes, but they're incredibly interesting and diverse animals, and they belong to an incredibly interesting and diverse group, which had previously been thought to be pretty dull and boring and cryptic. The pygmy slow loris is a good example of the loris. This hails from Asia. Another prosimian is the slender loris, also from Asia. The Porto from Africa, quite a large prosimian. The Greater Galigo, which is often called a bush baby, but this is the animal that we think of as a bush baby. There are, were at one time thought to be lots of different subspecies of these forms. Now they're considered standalone species. That's largely because there's been a shift in taxonomy, clearly as far as primates are concerned and a tendency, not so much a tendency, but a drive um, to create new species because they've been investigated at molecular level and they've been found to have what you and I might think of as relatively trivial differences but the, the differences stand and depending on who the scientists are and what their motives are and who they submit the information to it can be a species overnight. So almost overnight and certainly in terms of of studying primates, we've had an explosion of new species. So to recap, prosimian primates, again, the encycl Great Encyclopedia of Animals, includes lorises, lemurs, galagos, and sometimes tarsiers. 
they're old world primates, but I tend to think of lemurs as living in a world of their own. Most of us must now be aware that Madagascar is a place where um, there's a great deal of endem endemism, there's a great deal of diversity, and there's a great deal of uniqueness, but there's also a great deal of disruption. So there's approximately 100, 111, 114, 118 species, thank you, <laughs> of, of lemur. And this is in flux all the time, even more so now, because of the this, this splitting of species. And there are lots and lots of different kinds of lemurs, lots of different body plans. So when people talk about lemurs, it's a gross generalization right away. On the left, a fat-tailed dwarf lemur. Uh, it's a nocturnal um, lemur that, that hibernates. The top right is the mouse lemur, probably a brown mouse lemur. There used to be grey mouse lemurs, brown mouse lemurs. Now we've got several species of grey, grey mouse lemur and countless species of brown mouse lemur. Bottom right is the greater mouse lemur, the much bigger mouse lemur. That is in a genus of its own, whereas previously it used to be with Microcebus, which is the one on the top. So there's a constant revaluation going on of lemurs. This is what people think of as a lemur, typically. It's a, a diurnal lemur, although it looks like it's adapted for, um, for noct nocturnality. It is almost exclusively diurnal, and there's a great deal of information about this animal. <coughs> but, oh, too many. But wait a minute, these are lemurs too. That's Cochrane Shafak, that's the peculiar eye eye, which I'm sure everyone must know because of David Attenborough by now that that's an eye eye. Um, and on the bottom right, these are crown lemurs. The crown lemurs belong to the same family of so called diurnal lemurs, um, oil lemur, of which the mongoose lemur is also a member. Oil lemur includes very common species that you see in zoos brown lemurs, white fronted lemurs, red fronted lemurs, mongoose lemurs crowned lemurs. They've all got very similar body plan, dentition, feeding biology, and so on and so forth. But even they're not entirely um, typical, you know, from one species to another. There isn't really a typical lemur. One size fits all lemur. Now I've mentioned the eye at the top. That photograph was taken from a slide that I took donkeys years ago at the um, Duke University Primate Centre. You'll hear me talk about this place again. It was started way back in the 60s by a questionable personality called um, Boitner Janusz. Um, he went to jail for things that we can't discuss here. <laughs> but there was enough enthusiasm about the Primate Centre that he established to keep it going. And Elwin Simons was a particularly um, noted um, paleontologist he, he really saw the value of the colony. So for years it was called the Duke University Primate Centre. Now it's just called the Duke Lemur Centre as they've taken on more responsibility for conservation in the field and continuing studies in captivity. So we'll, we'll hear a bit more about them as we go on. So sexual dimorphism is among the lemurs. If you were to take a typical brown lemur, you'd be looking at the size of the head and the general appearance and the general build of a male and a female in order to discern the sexes, apart from the obvious, you know, checking out genitals. The mongoose lemur is one of the most strikingly dimorphic lemurs that there is. So the male always has this ruff of red fur around the cheeks, and it sometimes extends over the head and all the way down the shoulders, and also the intensity of the colour varies from one to another. So I suspect taxonomists will be tempted to explore differences at molecular level to decide whether or not we haven't been, you know, interbreeding lots and lots of different kinds of mongoose lemur as well. The female always has the black face and always has the white ruff, but very rarely um, exhibits variations on that theme, you know, for example, white fur around its head or in patches on its shoulders or anything like that. 
they really are the most striking animals. And they vary incredibly. If you, if, if you go on Google and Google mongoose labour and bring up the images, you'll see dozens and dozens of different variants. Whereas I, I only ever saw one or two variants when I was working in the zoos. So where does it come from? Well, as you can see, its distribution is extremely limited on Madagascar and within that, that range, everything is utterly, completely fragmented. It's very poorly studied and as we go through, we'll see Madagascar in a little bit more detail before we go on to Anjuan and the chorus and the significance of that. There, have, there hasn't been proper surveys specifically for mongoose lemurs on Madagascar. There have been some studies, but they've been few and far between. So up here in this very small corner of Madagascar, we have mongoose lemurs split up into diffuse populations that are themselves diffuse and poorly understood. At some point, in antiquity, probably around the 17th century, if not earlier, the mongoose lemur was introduced to Anjuan. It's the third largest of the Comoros Islands, and it actually gets on quite well there. Um, but before we go to the Comoros, there are different biomes on Madagascar. It's, this is why it's often referred to as a microcontinent. You don't know if you can read that schematic, but it says, deciduous forest, lowland forest, spiny thickets, subhumid for, sub forest, mangroves, what does that say? <laughs> <laughs> Ericoid thickets, seven succulent, succulent woods. That's what you get from just copying things without paying attention to what you're copying. But the interesting one is number one, because it obviously takes in the Mongoose Lemur's home range. And it's one of the few um, areas of Madagascar that has been looked at in totality and conservation terms. There are lots of NGOs all around Madagascar all doing their own thing. But up until now, the focus has been on the eastern side, where the rainforest is. You have a great ridge of high highlands running up the middle of the island, and you have this, these easterly forests, which are really, really rich in wildlife and rich in lemur diversity. So, Duke Lemur Center, um, has been working almost exclusively in, in Ranma Fan, even though they do have interests in other lemurs from other parts of the country. The conservation effort is, has been focused on the tropical forest on the eastern seaboard there. That's partly because of the hubris around rainforests in the, in the 80s. So who's got a rainforest? Let's conserve it. So the location of the Comoros Islands is in the Mozambique Channel between Madagascar and the, the coast of, uh, east coast of Kenya. It consists of four simple looking islands, but they're quite complicated. This, still, this is part of France. This constituted an Islamic Republic sometimes because Anjouan declared independence from the rest of them. So it became a really independent. Islamic Republic of its own, and that situation has never really been resolved. One of the things that I do go into my book, into in my book, because I think it's important, is the social and political issues around these places and the state of flux that they live in, virtually all the time. There's there's nearly always a crisis just around the corner, usually fomented by outside forces. So it occurs naturally in northwest Madagascar. It's where its distribution is patchy and diffuse. It is protected in the extensive Ankara Fatsika National Park. And there are other areas where it has been studied. But nowhere is it thought to be especially numerous. The park is notionally protected, but um, more importantly, there hasn't been that much research specifically into Mongoose lemurs in that park. Beyond that, and you'll see in the map in the next slide, is an interesting place called Mariarano. It's the Mariarano Matsudroi forest blocks. And this is why it's interesting. I really 
I hope you can see these. Um, there's lots of opportunities to look at this show on my website. There's lots of ways to see it after the fact. I'm quite willing to go back to slides at the end of things to clarify anything that you might want to know more about. So I've mentioned that the, the National Park, Ankara Fitsuka National Park. When you want to visit this area, you fly into Mahajanga Airport and you make your way circuitously either this way to Mitsinjino, which is where uh, one of the study sites was, the National Park there, the study site over here, sorry I'm getting lost, this is what I'm looking for. This site here is interesting because Operation Wallace has been sending um, young students out there in their gap year for many years and those students, some of them have gone back to continue their own, uh, with their own field of interest. The Mogus lemur was always known to occur there, but because people aren't looking for it, they haven't seen it. So that would be a really interesting place to, to survey. One, because the forest blocks are quite extensive and relatively uh, undisturbed, but also there's a conservation interest there already and a substrate to work on. Ankara Fatsika National Park is a bit of a disappointment insofar as so little information is coming out of it. So this is the study area where researchers have been, but not for quite some time, not since the, the mid-90s. I was there at this point, Anjamena. This is the river that runs through it. Mitsunjino is the next, the, the main village. Um, this kind of point of departure once you've uh, come in from from Mahajanga, all the connections get really primitive until you get to Mitsunjino and then you're really not very far away. But what's interesting is that you can disregard this. These are just trees. They're not, they don't necessarily represent forest, either secondary, primary, whatever. They're just showing tree cover. You'd have to be on the ground to know which areas here really matter for any kind of wildlife. This is just an indicative graphic. For instance, you can see all this greenery here um, on this little peninsula at Lac Kinconi. The lemurs were historically known, Mongus lemurs were historically known to circumscribe that area and they're, they're not, they haven't been seen there for a long, long time and they're considered now not to exist there. And I hope this has been clear because it's a lot of maps. So we we'll zoom in on the National Park. Now, the very first uh, study of Mongus lemurs in the 1970s was completed by uh, Ian Tattersall. I think he was at the University of Chicago at the time. And he's, now he's a famous primatologist and uh, a, a bit of an icon for people who are interested in lemurs and prosimians. But he con uh, completed the first study of the Mongus lemur at this place, Ampicheru, which is not really a forest, it's a, a forest station, it's a forestry location and it was really set up as a sort of example, example um, of the potential of forestry in this part of Madagascar. So it's really an artificial place and the presence of the, the Mogus lemurs even in the 1970s was relatively artificial because the animals came into the area and were sometimes even supplemented by people at the forestry field station. So the earliest studies are, you know, don't really contribute that much to our understanding of the Mongoose lemur in general. Um, it's really more of a first step, a point of departure for looking <coughs> elsewhere. And that, that just didn't happen. So we have studies in the 1970s, studies in 1990s, and studies in the 2010s. So you can see that there's an enormous gap in, it, in, our, in our understanding of this just this one species. I let on these areas. They are, these are not unexplored. It's just that people haven't been looking for mongoose lemurs specifically there. Although I know from my own experience and uh, the testimony of others that they were up there and they were relatively conspicuous. Um, They've been recorded there recently, but really only in ones or twos. Uh, 
and really in the, on the most casual encounter basis. There wasn't really a formal undertaking to go looking for them and record them every time you saw them. Why? Because they were looking at other lemurs, the, the bigger, more enigmatic and certainly more visible um, Shifaka, the cockerel Shifak. So that area has a great potential so that you can find, if, if mongoose lemurs can be included in the fauna around that area as, as being of some importance, then there's a good opportunity to, to have a little enclave there where people can go and study them and they'll be protected. Ankara Fatsika is far too big for most you know, undergraduate, postgraduates to set up a, an expedition and go looking specifically for one thing. A lot of the um, studies in the park are just about the general health of it, the general state of the place. So this is our friend, the Mongoose Lima, um, taken on Anjuan in the 1990s. It's a male, obviously, with the red fur. Um, you might think I'm a great photographer, that's from a slide photograph, but that lemur is no further away from me than you are. And they've become habituated there. And it is a curious anomaly. Um, I've gone on to explain why that is, and there's a good reason for it. And basically, there's a culture among the local people um, that it's okay to have lemurs around the place as long as they don't bother you, you, you don't bother them. And if you want to go and catch one and keep it as a pet, that's fine. And, and if it dies, that's fine too. And if it lives, that's fine too. They've got an extremely ambivalent attitude towards the mongoose lemur. The Comoros Islands are important for, because they um, are home to another endemic, the Livingston Spook Bat. And that's where they come from, these bats. They're the largest bats in the world. Um, and they're endangered, not only because their numbers have in the past dwindled and they're exposed to all sorts of threats and pressures, but they only come from the Comoros Islands. They don't come from anywhere else. They're not found on Madagascar. So that's why Anjuan and the Comoros is interesting to, to biologists. As it happens, we've also got mongoose lemurs there, so that's, that's interesting too. Even better, they're habituated to human beings and human settlements, so you can get up close and have a really good look at them. And you can also talk to people about their attitudes. Um, this is Anjuan. It's, it's the third largest island. Um, in order to get there, you have to go to Grand Comore and then maybe get a plane or maybe get a boat or maybe just wait until something happens. And it's the same It's the same today. I'm talking about quite a few years ago, but very, very little has changed in terms of accessibility, in terms of the economic status of the Comores, in terms of the political stability on among these islands. Very little has changed, except maybe what recent studies have indicated is regards to the mongoose lemur. Mutsamudu is the main town, and we were stationed not too far from there. I was working with the Jersey Zoo, and we were catching some female fruit bats, female Livingston fruit bats, to boost the captive population. That's primarily what I was there for, was to catch bats. Um, at the same time, I thought this is a good, good opportunity to have a look at mongoose lemurs, and I understood from previous um, papers that people were quite benign. They, they had an easygoing relationship with these lemurs and they were quite readily seen. And they were also kept as pets by, by local boys. So I thought I could, I, I could do that. I could go around all these villages and ask them about their attitude and see whether it was true. And um, I was desperately worried that I wouldn't see any lemurs. But on the very first night we were there, they were walking overhead on telephone lines, you know. And you'd hear them right away, this is a distinctive call, you know, and I thought, you can't, you're joking. You know, that's the place where we're staying there, a little rented house, and they're coming up to the house, you know, to let me see them. So, first impressions, I think tropical paradise, a lot of people do think that, and they do want to um, develop tourism there a little bit. But, as I've said in my book, and I've said before, Everywhere on Anjuan, you're either going up a hill 
or coming down it. And it is punishing, absolutely punishing. And I, we didn't even go up that far, you know, to catch the bats, uh, much less search for lemurs. So it's basically a, uh, an extinct volcano and it rises up out of the ocean like a big cone. And the further up you get to the, to the peak, um, the more dense the vegetation is. And I'm loath to say that any of this is primary or even secondary vegetation um, because our understanding of things is that secondary vegetation goes all the way up the slopes to, to almost to the peaks. And if there's any secondary or primary forest left of any description, um, it's very small, very remote, difficult to get to, and not studied at all, not evaluated at all. So, um, I had no idea you know, what it would be like. I'd never been to the tropics before. And uh, the first day that we had to walk up looking for bats, first finding the loose locations to establish, um, where would be the best place to catch the bats in the first place. Um, I was walking up this hill thinking I was Indiana Jones or something and I, I only got so far and I collapsed in a big heap and you know the, one of the one of the chapters with me he's bent over and he said, it doesn't look well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks you know but you know talk about an education I was lying there on the, on the deck, and I did recover, as you can see, and <laughs> there's this woman past us, and she had stacks and stacks and stacks of something in baskets, and she just walked right past me and stepped over me, and she just looked down and went, <laughs> laughed. <laughs> but I did the climatise, and it took, took a good few weeks. But the main thing was this, going from one elevation to another very quickly, soon learned not to do that. Um, as you go around the island, you discover that it's not all hills and mountains in the Sound of Music. It's quite heavily cultivated. And some recent pictures of Anjuan have shown um, erosion creeping up these slopes. And I think some of the reports were a wee bit dramatised about it because Google Maps and um, satellite images aren't showing complete and utter decimation of the, of the environment. But slowly but surely, gradually, as the population increases um, and the pressure on the land um, becomes ever greater, you have these little plains and plateaus that are, have been exploited and will continue to be exploited. Mutsamudu is the main town. I thought of no shame in saying it's a shanty town. That's exactly what it is. It's a great place, um, full of life, colour, smells, everything you expect from the tropics. Um, but the bats were really very, about half an hour walk from there, and so the lemurs were everywhere except this main town. There were hardly any in the town at all, so they're not really an urban mammal. They like the villages and the small communities. Part of the reason for that is that there's lots of food around the villages. Um, rice is a commodity that has to be imported, but there's lots of fruit that had been cultivated um, by successive projects, food projects. You know, so they've got jackfruit, they've got mango, they've got, what's the other thing? Um, oh, I've forgotten what half of them are again, I've listed to them in my book. But um, there's just so many domesticated, so many, so many cultivars, papaya, um, what's that? Mangosteen? No, no. Lychees. Oh. I can never remember it because <laughs> they used lychees. So, and they were particularly favoured, you know. Um, so it's essentially a suburban kind of situation with lemurs in your back garden like you might have foxes here. Oh. Went far too far forward. Yeah, um, so I had a guide who was a great, great guy. Um, worth his weight in gold and we went not only from village to village um, with him showing me the way and showing me the ropes but also he was a great person for introducing me to people because if you're, if you're the white guy you just walk straight into a village and it goes what would you want you know um, but if you have somebody to to break the ice as it were um, and you get a feel for 
what their attitude is, because he didn't know any better than me what they thought of mongoose lemurs. And generally speaking, most people were quite benign. Uh, at one village we got chased out of it because they were so hostile to lemurs, but that was one out of about 20 different villages. But you got around the island just by stopping a, a taxi Bruce's converted pickup. Um, you gave him a few coins and it stopped every five minutes to put pigs and goats and people on. Um, I was shocked but because most of the villages looked like that. Um, there is a built um, structure there. That's not uncommon. It might even be a mosque. Um, I've no reason to believe that villages are any better off now, although I, I do understand that the bigger communities have grown sufficiently to attract inward investment from outside, and so they're getting things like little, um, little hospitals and facilities that have been built by, let's say, outside interests. The Chinese have got a particular interest in the Comores now that France has virtually lost interest. But enough of politics. Um, Lemurs are more interesting. And to show just how habituated they are, it didn't take long to find a lemur like this that sat on the roof of a village, just taking in the surroundings. And I like these pictures that kind of tell a wee story. This is a, a mongoose lemur inside the village compound. And it was part of a sequence of photographs, although the others didn't come out very well, of the kids teasing the lemurs down with bananas. Um, so they can be habituated very readily in some villages, not all. Um, and at the same time, it's relatively easy to catch one. They, they chase the females until they drop the baby picked up and reared it in the village. So the, these animals are literally you know, here. So that's one of the guides that we used, and that's somebody else's lemur, but it hopped from one person's shoulder to another. So they can be, they, they can suffer in captivity at the hands of these kids, but at other times, this, this chap's probably about three or four years old at least, so he's been well cared for. And it's kind of, I've seen them doing it, you know, there's one tethered in a kitchen and people throw through it food all the time. You, that one's a good photograph because it's, shows you um, a couple of things. He's quite proud of his pet lemur. Um, but the black face of the female is really distinctive. Also interesting that they really saw pet females. Most of them were, were males. Same because there's a different lemur. It, it might give the impression that they were catching lemurs wholesale, but the photographs are from a handful of villages. It's not really representative. You wouldn't go and see uh, you know, a captive lemur in every single village we went to. But one thing that I, I was a wee bit encouraged uh, to see was that they're relatively well cared for in terms of nutrition. So why do they catch lemurs? Well, there's no Toys R Us or Smythes or Amazon or anything like that, or even the pound shop in, um, in the Comoros Islands. I had another photograph of one, I just found it the other day. Again, this is from a slide when I was there. This is a toy car that someone's made out of tins and God knows what. And one of the best pictures I had was of a, a kid with a whole lot of plastic bags rolled up in a little frame and he was flying it as a kite. <laughs> so these kids have got nothing to do and all day to do it in, and they thought nothing of walking miles, miles and miles, in order to go and catch a lemur, in order to have a companion, a plaything, or whatever. But they didn't really have any affection for the animals. They, didn't, they weren't pets in that sense. Here's Mahmoud, he's my guide. Um, I could have achieved nothing without him, and um, the book wouldn't have been written without him because I wouldn't have had any data at all of my own. Um, I'm loath to say to flesh out the text because it, a lot of the captive work was mine as well. Um, but without this kind of life-changing experience and the insights that this man gave me, uh, you know, I just couldn't have achieved anything else after that. There was one day I was really fed up, I'd had enough, and um, 
there was a little stream, it was just a little stream with a lot of stepping stones. And I was exhausted, I had enough. And uh, him and his flip flops, he just stepped over it. You know. He stood on the other side waiting for me. <coughs> you could see that I didn't want to negotiate these stepping stones because they looked terribly slippy. So I took my boots off and waded across the river. And as I was coming across, he says, Mike, come on, the white man can do anything. <laughs> But yeah, so in captivity, traditionally undervalued and overlooked, here's a male and female mongoose lemur, mongoose lemur at London Zoo, utterly neglected, shut in a back den, out of sight, out of mind. You can't see here properly, but it's because they were fat, it was because they were overweight, and they didn't want to have them on the exhibit. We changed that soon enough and got rid of the excess fat. They had a a little operation to remove the adipose tissue, uh, put them out in a bigger enclosure and they didn't put the weight on back on again because we weighed them at regular intervals. But that, that was the beginning of my interest in those animals because I thought you can't, it was endangered, you know, you can't treat endangered animals like that. If you can't do something with them, then don't do anything at all, you know, give it to somebody else. So this is from Duke Lemur Center and there's a sequence of photographs here that's going to show you variations of, a, of an unattractive theme, you know, animals in captivity. For a long time this was thought to be perfectly adequate um, accommodation for lemurs of any description, you know. A few bits of two by two and some mesh and some heat lamps, you can still see that. Then you've got what's more typical zoo structure, solidly built with a reasonable amount of room, a cuboid shape, but with very little in the way of furniture or stimulation. That's, that's like normal or has been normal up until relatively recently. So one day the people at Duke Lever Centre woke up and realised that the Lever Centre was in the middle of a forest, Duke Forest. So they thought, why don't we just build a fence, electrify it and let the lemurs out. So, that's what they did. And so they built natural habitat enclosures that between one in one hectare and five hectares. And these are these are a massive area and they, they let loose mixed species, but having said that, relatively small groups of each one. They did think happy days we can have twenty-five ring tail lemurs or sixteen round lemurs or that. you know, a typical zoo would, would do that. They would think, Oh, look at all that room, let's throw everything in it and use up the space. So they gave the space over to the animals. And because it's an academic um, resource, the reason for it was primarily to study the animals, hopefully exhibiting m more natural behavior, behaviors. It, it is interesting that they subsisted almost entirely um, of the available vegetation, but they did give them supplementary food um, every two or three days just to bring them in and have a look at them and make sure they were okay and give them just enough food to make sure they would have peace of mind as much as anything. This is Shafak halfway up a tree. I've got dozens of pictures of like this. We'd be here till 10 o'clock at night I was going to show you them. But this is still a human-animal interface and the animals are still habituated to people. So it is an artifice, it's a zoo. You can do no getting away from that. It doesn't matter how big the enclosure is. It's still a zoo. But one of the interesting things about that is that it did help to shape people's thinking about these sorts of enclosures. There's a little zoo over in Fife and they have ringtail lemurs and they've got a nice little area, a nice little paddock. There's no question of putting them in a rickety rackety shed. There's no question of putting them in, in a situation that's just full of hard architecture. Similarly, they don't have the resources to just let them run wild and it would probably be breaking about a dozen different laws in the UK. There's, there's a little, little bit more laissez-faire in, uh, in America with regards to regulations covering wild animals. But one of the things that I wanted, wanted to bring out was put the mongoose lemur into context. There is nothing unique about it. It is poorly studied in its native um, habitat, it's threatened in its na native habitat, it was introduced, naturalised to another location where it is apparently thriving, 
The suggestion is that there could be as many as 9,000 of them on Anjouan. Um, they exist in captivity. There's just about enough. Well, there only ever was just enough animals to build a self-sustaining population. But collectively, zoos have never taken that step for that species to really, really build up the, the captive population globally into something that is meaningful. The best hope, if you like, for the mongoose lima is um, the population on Anjuan. But that's dependent on two things. The tolerance levels of people on the island and the interest that there should be in putting, say, a field station there and building on the benign attitude that the animals, the people have got to the animals and building relationships with conservation organisations. They're halfway there anyway with the, um, with the Livingston's fruit bat. So there seems to be a difficult step to adopt Anjouan as the base, if you like, a hub for mongoose lemur studies reaching out into Madagascar rather than the other way around. The old mine tamarin, rescued from extinction by a captive breeding program, it once um, lived in extensive co coastal rainforest in, in Brazil. It was reduced in the 80s and 70s even to tiny, tiny, tiny fragments. And they are protected and it's an ongoing program. And the Smithsonian Washington Zoo, they have been active with this species for the first part of 40 years. And they still have to, um, what's the word? They, they still have to execute hands-on management with them. They found yellow fever, an outbreak of yellow fever with these animals. And they stepped in with the veterinary team to catch as many as they could and inoculate them against yellow fever. So the gold mine tamarin exists in a zoo in the wild. And if you see their pockets of habitat from the air, they are just islands of forest in a green desert. Proboscis monkey, similarly fragmented. Bonnie was a big island, but they're almost absent from the centre of the island. They cling to habitat that is being fragmented along riverbanks all the way around the island. They're subject to all kinds of use and abuse, but the main thing is that the habitat is not just shrinking, but being broken up into tiny pieces and there's no, no connectivity. There was a feature about them on the BBC, when what, what, what was, no, it was, a, it was a feature about them trying to get across the river. The drill, superficially, um, not threatened, quite numerous, but again, existing in lots and lots of different places. Um, and possibly even a separate species on the island of, of Bioko. So they exist in lots of different countries and the populations in each of those countries are fragmented. So diff fragmented locations, fragmented populations. This isn't just a thing that's specific specific to the mongoose labour, it's repeated time and time and time again. Um, the habitat uh, on the Orango Mountains, where the mongoose, where the mountain gorilla exists, that's essentially a zoo in the wild. There's a great deal of intervention goes on with these animals and has done, you know, for a lot of years. But the main point is that their continued existence depends on us, depends, depends on us not damaging the um, environment further, not damaging the animals, either killing them through kindness by introducing pathogens or incursions by paramilitaries or um, bandits, whatever you want to call them. These people are heavily armed and so we really have to protect nature in a very, very direct way. But the main thing to consider about it is that um, it, it exists in different places with different um, priorities um, for not just people but governments um, in each of those countries and their relationship with each other. So this is a, a, a pitiful situation with orangutans. Um, we tend to think of the orang Utan as a victim of clear felling, the habitat's there, one day it's gone the next. But it's just as important for them 
to have enclaves that are completely protected and harder and harder all the time to achieve that goal. It's, and it's not just primates, I've been focusing on primates because they're, they're my area, if you like. Um, I consider myself quite well up to speed with most of the different mammals that there are. Um, the Cape is a fantastic animal, only discovered in 1901, um, and now it's an endangered species for the same reason. It had a very limited range. That range is broken up, fragmented, and it now depends on partly on a captive breeding program, but also partly on breeding station in areas uh, of, its, of its home range that have been disrupted and destroyed. And uh, the Okapi breeding station was attacked on several occasions. On one occasion, um, they killed a lot of animals and killed a lot of rangers. So it is a war. You know, lots of people who are out there in these range countries trying to protect animals are themselves being attacked, assaulted, abused, and ordered. That's one extreme. Another extreme is the um, lead bass possum, that's the top right. Again, another species with a very limited range um, and broken up in the Victorian highlands of Australia uh, into little habitats um, that, where the animal is entirely dependent on eucalyptus, and in particular um, de uh, degraded eucalyptus for forest because they need hollow trees um, to nest in. So the subject of a great push to conserve them, and then also the subject of a great pushback against people who wanted to, uh, by people who wanted to exploit that habitat. This is a common pattern in that nothing stays the same. You might, we might feel that we've put in the, the correct measures, but in order to make them last, the, the pressure has to be kept up. So when people say we've got to do something about it, I think soon we're going to start, start saying we're going to have to keep doing something about it forever. And this little slide here I think is one of the most important because this is a scimitar horned oryx. It was extinct in the wild and brought back from extinction through a captive breeding program. And nothing sums up the dystopian, dys dysfunctional attitude um, or relationship with wild animals that, that humans have than this photograph because this is an endangered species that numbers in its thousands. It wouldn't exist if we hadn't intervened. This animal is the um, oryx. <laughs> it's gone straight away. It's not the base oryx. It's the... God, it's gone straight away. Anyway, two species of oryx. One's the base oryx. It's rarer than this one. Um, and this is, exists in its thousands all around the world because it's a game animal. And it's quite rare, and it's not at all uncommon in its home range in South Africa, but we've decided that that's an animal that we, we kill for pleasure. But the one in the middle, also an animal, we've decided that that one can live. So, one last remark about Anjuan is that this can be a good enclave, Anjuan, for Morris Deemers, but the people's attitude has to stay the, stay the same and not be influenced by other people. And you might well think, well, fat chance. You know, because when it comes to uh, the choice between lemurs and food, people will take food every time. And if someone comes up um, with a grand plan, a great scheme to replace all the cultivars that have accumulated on Anjuan for years, um, clear them all out and put in some superfood, then the longest neighbor could quickly become a pest, and then its status could completely change. That's why, th that's, <coughs> that's why I think a presence on the island is probably more important than a presence on Madagascar, because Madagascar's got a lot of ground to cover when you talk about a single species. So I'm sorry for spluttering and going blank, um, but I don't do many of these. And I've gotten used to going to Wikipedia as well <laughs> when I get a mind melt. Um, <coughs> does anybody have any questions? Do you want to go back over anything? Are we, are we well, thanks for the class.